don't we love our p-values? The researcher's security blanket. Let's get some p-values. Let's visit the p-value casino for significance roulette. Spin the wheel, in with the ball. Holding your breath, where will it land? P.6. Quick, again. Another p-value. Round it goes, where will it land? P less than 01. Two stars. Surely that's all a bit of nonsense. A ridiculous party trick that bears no relation to real research. I'll explore that in a moment. But first, here's an outline of what I'd like to do. An astonishing thing is that if you repeat an experiment, you are very likely to get quite a different p-value. In other words, the sampling variability of the p-value is really amazingly large. To illustrate this, I'll play with the dance of the p-values and significance roulette. And then in the next video, I'll explain p-intervals, sort of like error bars on a p-value. My conclusion will be that a p-value is just not to be trusted and that we simply shouldn't use p-values at all. There are very much better ways. I'll mention our introductory statistics textbook that explains some of these better ways. But first, how do researchers think about p-values? That's an excellent topic for research, but surprisingly, has hardly been studied at all. I suggest most researchers probably think of the p-value as a measure of strength of evidence against the null, following Sir Ronald Fisher, and that's quite sensible. I suggest they also think of p in terms of these bands. Three stars, p less than 001, through to greater than 0.1. And there's language associated with those categories, very highly significant through to between 05 and 10, approaching, how do you know it's not running away from significance as hard as it can? And this achingly suggests true three stars, you can hardly get closer to being definite. P greater than 0.1, there's no effect, or perhaps it's even zero. And these p-values elicit emotion from elation through to much more negative emotions. And we can mark these bands. Three stars jumping for joy, two stars still positive. Oh, bit of frustration there, and you don't want to hear this one. There it is. And these things matter. They use these p-values to make decisions in the real world. Well, if p indicates truth, presumably if we repeat the experiment, just the same with a new sample, we get more or less the same truth. Let's consider a typical experiment. Say, two independent groups, each of size n equals 32, with a true population effect size of half a standard deviation. That's traditionally a medium size effect. So here we have the two population distributions, their mean separated by half a standard deviation, or 10 points. Let's run an experiment. Here we have the control data, control mean and 95% confidence intervals, and the same for experimental. We can mark the difference between these sample means on this difference axis, and see that this experiment estimated the difference to be about 3 we can put a confidence interval on that difference. And then we can repeat the experiment. The first result drops down. The next experiment estimated a difference of round about 20. We can repeat and run that down. And there we have the dance of the confidence intervals. These intervals dancing around exactly as we should expect. Let's indicate the true difference in the population with this dotted line at 10 and then we can mark any intervals that do not include the true difference in red. So if we continue the dance, every now and again we'll get a, a red interval, and in the long run, by the definition of 95% confidence intervals, we should expect that 95% of these intervals will be green and 5% red because they do not include the true value. Let's now think about p-values. If we run an experiment, this one happens to 
estimate about 7, the confidence interval overlaps the null hypothesis value 0, and so p is greater than 0.05. Another experiment happened to estimate about 12, and p is 1 star, 0.015. Another experiment, again, the confidence interval overlaps 0, p.3. Run these experiments down. And there we have the dance of the confidence intervals, exactly as we expect, as we saw before, and the dance of the p-values. I suggest the astonishing thing here is the immense variability, the immense unpredictability of these p-values. They range everywhere from 3 stars, 0 0.000, 000 to 0 0.52, 0 0.59, and everything in between. Here is the dance of the p-values, another demonstration of just how unpredictable, how widely varied p-values are. No single p-value really tells us anything we can trust. Now these p-values come from a distribution. And here is the probability distribution of the p-value for this typical experiment. That's two groups of 32 with a true difference of 0.5. The area under this curve is 1. And we can put a line in here at the 0.05 p-value. And 52% of the area is to the left of that under the curve. And that corresponds to the power of this typical experiment being about 0.5. You've got a 0.5 chance of getting statistical significance. And that corresponds with what has been found over the last 50 years or so in some research areas in psychology and other disciplines. The typically published experiment has a power of round about a coin toss of getting statistical significance for a medium size true event. Now let's divide this area under the curve into 38 equal areas and label each of these little areas with its central p-value. So they're 0.488, and they're the high ones, and down here there are many, many tall, narrow ones with small p-values. And let's arrange these 38 values haphazardly around a roulette wheel. And here is that wheel, same as the one we saw before. Spinning this wheel is exactly equivalent to running our typical experiment. Who would like to give it a try? Oh yes sir, your PhD. Place your PhD on the table, give me your credit card, and round it goes, holding your breath. Oh, 0.14, not statistically significant. I think that was a pilot test. Free pilot tests today. Let's spin again. Holding your breath, where will it land? Again, 0.18. Well, we don't know anyone who would just keep on spinning until they get statistical significance, do we? But this might be your third experiment. Oh, 0.02, one star, well on the way to your PhD. Oh, yes, madam, your postdoc. Of course, put it on the table, give me your credit card, and round it goes. One star, that's a very good star. Oh, again, right? Yes, round it goes. Are you holding your breath, crossing your fingers? Where will it land? Oh, oh nearly three stars, 0.41. Not your lucky day, I'm afraid. Oh, Professor, yes. This will save you an immense amount of time and effort. You don't need to worry about uh, ethics approval or recruiting subjects, collecting data. Just lay your research grant application on the table and give me your credit card and here we go. Oh, I could tell you were a very smart experimenter. You'd like to go again? Ah, well, build up a portfolio. 0.73, not so lucky this time. One final go? Yes, of course. Two stars. Perhaps your research grant has a reasonable chance.
So getting a p-value is just like spinning a roulette wheel. And for our typical experiment, this is the wheel, summarized by this distribution here. You've got four chances out of 38 of three stars, down to 14 out of 38 of p greater than 0.1. So a p-value is highly unreliable, and it's a tragedy that researchers regard it as signaling certainty. They obsess about the particular value of p down to the second decimal place. Any p-value can be highly misleading. Just by a flip of the wheel, we could have obtained a much different p-value. So what is the alternative to p-values? Estimation based on confidence intervals. Bayesian estimation based on credible intervals is another good alternative. All a researcher knows is the data and the confidence interval calculated from the data, and if you like also, a p-value. We need to think of our single confidence interval as one from a whole dance. <laughs> The p-values and confidence intervals are based on the same theory, and we can translate back and forth between the two. Our single confidence interval is highly informative. It captures all the relevant information in the data, and the extent of the interval, the amount of uncertainty, tells us about the amount of bouncing around in the dance. In contrast, a single p-value tells us virtually nothing about the whole dance. A p-value is not to be trusted and may easily mislead. Prefer estimation and simply don't use p-values. It's time to do away with p-values. Once we have a confidence interval, a p-value adds nothing. P-values are not to be trusted, likely to mislead. Throw away the security blanket. Simply don't use p-values at all. This article discusses the distribution of the p-value with explanations and formulas. I advocate using not p-values, but estimation based on confidence intervals and meta-analysis. I refer to these as the new statistics. The techniques themselves are not new, but using them as the main approach to data analysis would, for many disciplines, be quite new and a big step forward. There are new statistics resources there and in my first book. Open science is probably the most exciting and important development in recent years in how good science is done. It's a series of practices for improving the reproducibility or trustworthiness of our scientific research. Open science is based strongly on replication, which requires meta-analysis and estimation, and does, does not need to make any use of p-values. In this new introductory book with Bob Callan Jagerman, we take a new statistics and open science approach. We do discuss p-values from chapter 6 onwards, so students can read the past literature, but the emphasis all through the book is on new and better ways than new statistics, estimation, and open science. With the book, there are many resources, including software, examples, videos, and all these goodies are available at this website here, which is also our statistics blog. Enjoy! And may all your confidence intervals be short. <laughs>